Hello and welcome everybody to episode four of the Saturdays are for the Byzantine podcast. I am Professor Wren and I am your host again. Professor Wren is merely a pseudonym. I am not claiming to be a uh, professor at any university, nor do I claim to have a PhD. Uh, However, were I to be employed at a university, my title would be professor, so that's why I've chosen that title. Uh, You may notice that although... Uh, This is the fifth episode that will have been released on our podcast stream. Uh, I'm calling it episode four because uh, Constantine and Christianity took up two parts, and so uh, that was episode three. So I'm calling this episode four, even though technically five episodes will have been released. Before we get started, please remember to uh, subscribe on YouTube, if you're watching this on or listening to this on YouTube, please make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss another episode. Please make sure to follow us on Spotify, subscribe on Apple Podcast, check us out on Google Play, um, and you can also I have an Instagram page set up for this uh, for the show. The name of the Instagram page is Academics underscore ninety five. And that's the academics is spelled A C A D E M I X underscore nine five. Uh, It was an account that I had set up previously for uh, some other things that I was doing when I uh, in the past I had uh, applied for PhD programs, and so the idea of the account was kind of to like follow that process. It didn't really work out. I have applied for uh, PhDs again this year. We'll see if it works out. Sometimes life just gets in the way. Um, you can follow us on Instagram there. I post when, uh, the shows are posted. I'll sometimes post, uh, funny memes that I find about, you know, history as we go through this. Um, and so that's another good way that you can interact with the show. So for today's episode, we are going to be examining Constantine's legacy. So we're going to examine Constantine's legacy from a couple of perspectives. We're going to talk about his religious legacy his military legacy, his civil legacy, uh, moving the capital, right? Starting Constantinople is obviously a big part of Constantine's legacy. And then as well, we're going to talk about his family legacy. What state does he leave the empire in after he dies and how do his descendants uh, fare uh, ruling the empire after him? So to go over Constantine's religious legacy, obviously he uh, issues the Edict of Milan along with Bishop or I should say St. Ambrose, who was Bishop of Milan, uh, which was an edict of Christian tolerance, embraced Christianity, as well as granted the Catholic Church a number of privileges in the Roman Empire. Discussed that at length in our last two episodes. So if uh, you want to hear more about that, I'd recommend go and listen to our episodes entitled Constantine and Christianity. Uh, this also, uh, Constantine also sets somewhat of a precedent for an independent church from the state, right? So the church being independent from the state, uh, which we see, for example, at the Council of Nicaea, right? We remember that even though Constantine himself is an Arian Christian, and actually his children are Arian Christians as well, and they're going to give uh, St. Athanasius, who's a Nicene Christian, a hard time. They're part of the reason why he gets exiled a number of times, but... Even though the Council of Nicaea rules against Arianism, Constantine does not interfere with that. He does not try to uh, cudgel the bishops and and the pope into uh, ruling what he would want to rule. Instead, he allows them to come to their own conclusions. Uh, Constantine and his family as well build a number of churches. Uh, The best known church that Constantine built would obviously be the Church of the Holy Sepulcher in Jerusalem. And this is a a church built over the tomb of Jesus. And within the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, there is what's called the Edicule, which is a shrine built around um, the tomb of Jesus. And you, when you go inside the Edicule, there's the stone slab on which Jesus' body was placed. Uh, I say this as a matter of fact because uh, a number of years ago, a guy named Martin Biddle, or Biddles, um, did a documentary uh, with his wife. Martin Biddles is a uh, archaeologist. Um, I believe currently he's at Oxford, I want to say. Um, and he did uh, a study and 
along with the documentary with his wife on the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, its history, and whether or not it kind of lines up, does the location of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre line up with the historical and archaeological evidence um, to suggest that Jesus was actually buried there. And the Biddle's conclusion is that, yes, Jesus was, in fact, uh, after they've studied the history and they've studied the archaeology, uh, that the the location of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is, in fact, where Jesus was buried, which is pretty cool to think about. Uh, I don't believe uh, Martin Biddle's is a Christian either. I, I want to say he's an atheist. So it's not like he has uh, a Christianity as kind of a bias in his conclusion in that study. Uh, Constantine's mother, who's St. Helen, uh, so Constantine's mother is a saint, he is not. Uh, but so she went on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land, where uh, she also founds a number of churches, and she actually um, does some work as well to help Constantine with his project in the building of the Holy, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Uh, but Constantine's mother builds two, or well, she doesn't personally build them, has two notable churches builded, built, excuse me. Uh, one is in Bethlehem, and that is the Church of the Nativity, obviously, because Jesus was born in Bethlehem, and that's where the nativity scene was. Uh, and then she also has a church built at the Mount of Olives, which was where Jesus uh, was arrested after the Last Supper, and that is called the Church of Eliona, or Eliana, I don't know. Um... She also uh, claims to have found the true cross and the site upon, and on that site, Constantine built uh, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Uh, my dad actually took a trip to Israel uh, when I was a little kid, and he uh, went to go see the, the true cross, uh, which was covered in dust, and he said that uh, when no one was looking, he took a little bit of paper towel and wiped some of the dust off the cross. So in our and then he put it in a, in a medicine bottle, and so somewhere in my parents' house, in a in a little medicine bottle, is dust uh, from the true cross. So that's that's pretty fun. Uh, and as we talked about in our last episode, Constantine's conversion to Christianity, uh, as far as I'm concerned, was not uh, politically motivated. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any uh, political benefit to Constantine converting to a small yet growing religion, which was heavily persecuted. Um, I really do not see the political expediency in converting to a religion where the adherents to that religion are being fed to hungry lions in the Colosseum, right? <laughs> Now we move on to uh, Constantine's military legacy. So Constantine, as well as being a very influential figure in the history of Christianity, also was a really, really high-level uh, general. Uh, really, one of one of the great uh, military leaders of the Roman of the Roman Empire. Uh, one of the most important things that Constantine did in terms of military was he kind of divided the military into two general categories of soldiers. Uh, one was called the Limitaneus, and the other was called the Comitatus. So if you've ever played uh, Attila Total War or uh, Rome Total War Barbarian Invasion, the expansion pack for the original Rome Total War, you know, you know what I'm talking about here. Uh, but if you don't, don't worry, I'll go into a bit of a description, and maybe even if you've played those games before, you'll get a little clarification here. So, we'll start with the Limitaneus. So, these were lightly armed, uh, not very well-trained soldiers. Their job, they were not mainline soldiers. These were not soldiers who you would bring into any kind of serious battle. Their jobs, they were, you know, they uh, were stationed at garrisons along the border. Uh, so, they were uh, stationed in border forts, and they would watch for raiding parties coming across uh, either the Rhine River or the Danube River or other places in the empire uh, where there were borders, right? And so what they would do is they would kind of mirror, if a raiding party came across, they would mirror that force for a while. They'd probably set some signal fires to notify uh, other people that a, a raiding party had entered the empire and then also would have provided intelligence to a main army uh, if a raiding party were to enter. Now, the people who were the mainline soldiers were the comitatus, right? So if 
they're kind of the opposite. So comitatus are well-trained, well-paid, and versatile soldiers. These are your Roman main line infantry. You can think of these kind of as the late Roman version of a legionary. So a comitatus would have fought with a large uh, oval-shaped shield instead of the classical Roman legion's uh, rectangular-shaped shield. Uh, they still would have fought with a sword. The legionaries, the classical uh, Roman legionaries, uh, would have thrown a pilum or a javelin, uh, before they charged into battle, the, Ro the late Roman comitatus threw what was called a plumbata, which was an iron dart. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what or uh, why the Roman military decided to make that change, but they did. Uh, and then the comitatus also would have worn a shirt of chainmail. And at some points during the classical Roman period, uh, legionaries did wear chainmail, but eventually. As the years went on, they switched to a segmented armor, which was uh, like lines of s solid metal that went across the body, and they kind of looked like almost like scales. On a, if you ever, like, a, it looked a lot like a snake belly. You can think of it like that. Uh, the comitatus, as I said, uh, very versatile troops. Uh, they were trained to do a number of things. They were mainline infantry, but they were also trained, for example, to uh, fight with the bow. Um, so instead of having a unit of mainline heavy infantry and then a unit of light archers behind them uh, for skirmishing purposes, why not just have your mainline heavy infantry also carry a bow with them, and then you can pay one guy to do two jobs instead of paying two guys to do two jobs, right? So this cuts down on the amount of men you need in the army, and as well, it also cuts down on the amount of money you have to spend per soldier. However, this does necessitate that the comitatus are paid very well because they can do a lot of different things. Constantine also uh, reduces the size of a legion from roughly 5,000 men down to about 1,200 men. This is kind of the opposite direction of that uh, Diocletian took. Diocletian was increasing the size of the army, increasing the size of units. Constantine, although I'm, I want to say Constantine was not necessarily decreasing the overall number of soldiers. What he was doing is dividing the units into smaller groups. And the reason for this is because at this point in time in the Roman Empire, you have a lot of raiding parties that are coming in and out of the empire, whether it's in the west along the Rhine River, whether it's kind of in the middle of the empire along the Danube, or whether it's in the east uh, on the Persian frontier. Lots of small uh, raiding parties are coming into the empire and causing a lot of havoc. And so the best way to counteract that are smaller groups of men, smaller armies, which are more maneuverable, which can maneuver faster, uh, which are better at tracking down small raiding parties, right? A big 5,000-man legion is good for entering a big pitched battle against a large enemy force, not very good at tracking down uh, several hundred or maybe 1,000 uh, Frankish raiders who have just come in across the Rhine and are wreaking havoc in Gaul. Again, maneuverability is the idea here. The Romans are not fighting as many pitch battles, although they're, just, they're still fighting pitch battles, but they're not fighting the same large-scale uh, battles that you would have seen, uh, for example, Julius Caesar fight. Those are, they're still happening, but it's not quite the name of the game in late antique Roman warfare. Maneuverability is also important because it can help you actually preserve your armies. Many times what the Romans would actually try to do is surround an enemy raiding party to the point where they submit them into surrender without actually fighting. Because let's also remember that if a comitatus soldier, like an individual soldier within a comitatus unit, it has to be a very versatile soldier. That means it's going to take a good amount of time and a good deal of investment to train that soldier to the point where he's competent on the battlefield, uh, to the point where you need him to be. Uh, and then when you, if you lose those soldiers, obviously it's going to take a lot of time and money and investment 
to replace those soldiers. So if you can approach the enemy in such a way where you can make them surrender without fighting them and without losing any of your own men, that's obviously uh, preferable to engaging in pitch combat. And even if you know you win a convincing victory, you're still going to be losing some soldiers. And obviously, it's better to not have to replace those guys. Those guys. Oftentimes, what would happen is a barbarian uh, raiding party would come across the border. The Romans might send several, you know, 1,000 to 1,200 man legions to maneuver and cut off the line of retreat of that raiding party. The Romans would attempt to surround and make them surrender without fighting, although obviously, you know, sometimes that's not going to happen. Sometimes you are going to have to fight an actual uh, pitch battle. Uh, But oftentimes, uh, the Romans would surround their enemies and either escort them back to the border and send them back into, you know, across across the Rhine or across the Danube or back into Persia. Or uh, as well, what sometimes happens is the Romans will allow this barbarian raiding party to settle in a vacant part of the empire so long as that barbarian group agrees to you know pay taxes and to not cause trouble and sometimes military service as auxiliaries is also going to be uh, required of them Constantine also fights a campaign in Dacia towards the end of his life so Dacia would be um in the modern Balkans, uh, kind of what you think of as Transylvania. So uh, he fights the he fights the campaign in Dacia. Uh, he Constantine fights with a group of barbarians called the Sarmatians. Now the Sarmatians were uh, descended from Iranians, right? We think if you think way way back into uh, almost primitive man moving across the globe. Right, many groups came up out of Iran, moved across the Caucasus Mountains, and then came uh, westward down into Europe. And so the Sarmat- the Sarmatians were one of these groups. Uh, it, initially, kind of historically, they lived in modern Ukraine, uh, and they were they sort of replaced the Scythians. The Scythians were as well another um, Iranian group that lived on the Eurasian steppe, and some people we'll uh, say as well, into the Central Asian steppe. And, but roughly between 400 and 200 BC, uh, the Scythians are sort of replaced with the Sarmatians, kind of a similar group, though, uh, primarily fought on horseback, living on the Eurasian steppe. And so the Romans, with Constantine, fight with the Sarmatians against the Goths, who are living in Dacia at that time. Now, the Romans actually did control Dacia at one point in time under uh, Trajan, but that area had since been abandoned. And the initial campaign of the Romans with the Sarmatians against the Goths was a success. However, the Sarmatians rebelled against the Romans uh, soon afterwards, and Constantine had to go up into Dacia and put down the Sarmatian rebellion. Now, Constantine, in his Uh, younger years, back when he was with Diocletian, uh, spent many years fighting the Persians, and the Persians uh, fight heavily on horseback, and this almost certainly prepared Constantine to fight against the Sarmatians as well, who also fought primarily on horseback. So, you know, fighting similar uh, groups of people using similar tactics, Constantine would have seen uh, many of the uh, cavalry-based tactics uh, with the Sarmatians, or at least similar tactics that the Sarmatians used that the Persians probably would have used as well. And I attempted to look up, I've, I've talked to a couple of people and I've done a bit of research. It seems Constantine may have had an undefeated record in battle, although I'm not entirely sure. If any of you know, you can leave a comment in the uh, comment section on the YouTube video. You can find our YouTube channel, uh, search up Professor Run. Part of the reason, by the way, that the name of the YouTube channel is Professor Run and not named after the um, show itself, Saturdays are for the Byzantines, is because I actually have uh, project ideas for podcast series to do after uh, Saturdays for the Byzantines is completed. And so I just thought it would be easier to put them all in under one YouTube channel as opposed to creating separate YouTube channels for each podcast. 
that's a bit of a tangent, but anyway. Uh, in terms of Constantine's sigil, uh, sigil, civil legacy, uh, he worked to better organize the bureaucracy that Diocletian started. You remember Diocletian uh, broke up the Roman province from generally large provinces into much smaller provinces, uh, allowed for uh, more localism to occur, but then also, obviously, the smaller administrative regions you have, you need people to staff those individual reasons, which creates large bureaucracy. Uh, and what Constantine did was he created more set ranks, titles, and responsibilities for these bureaucrats. And it was basically better communicated what everyone's job is. Here's the hierarchy. This is your job. This is your job. You guys uh, answer to this boss, and you are in charge of these group of people, so on and so forth. Constantine also maintains Diocletian's court proceedings. Now, you remember, if you go back to the episode on Diocletian, that was our first episode, uh, Diocletian took the uh, Roman uh, court proceedings from a very, you could say, plain Jane, uh, cut and dry type of uh, court protocol, and he turned it into a much more Eastern-styled, uh, ostentatious, bedazzled version, right? He goes from sitting on a plain bench to sitting on a throne. He goes from wearing a plain white toga to wearing uh, a purple robes and a bedazzled uh, crown. Uh, previous Roman empires didn't, emperors didn't wear crowns. And so Constantine maintains this kind of stuff. And again, this that uh, uh, the style of the Eastern Roman court going forward is going to have influence on a lot of other things. For example, uh, the Eastern Christian uh, liturgy. Constantine as well also moves the capital of the Roman Empire from Rome to obviously Constantinople, the city named after himself. Constantine moves it, so the, uh, there had previously been a city in that area called Byzantium. Now this is where we get the word Byzantine from, right? The, the Eastern Roman capital was at Constantinople which had previously been called Byzantium. And so this is where we get the word Byzantine. Now, again, it's important to remember, I think I've said this before, but it's worth repeating that the Byzantines never called themselves Byzantines. They thought of themselves as Romans. In their mind, there was no difference between uh, you know, the Byzantine Empire uh, throughout its whole existence. There was no difference between that and classical Rome. There was no difference between Emperor Constantine and Julius Caesar. There was no difference between Justinian and Trajan. There was no difference between Alexius Comnenus and the Emperor Augustus. They sat in the same seat, they held the same position, they held the same power. Uh, and the term Byzantine is, does not develop or does not come into use until, I believe it's the 18th century English historians uh, start using it as sort of as an attempt to separate uh, classical pagan Rome from late antique uh, Christian Rome. Uh, Constantinople is built on seven hills, just like the just like Rome was, and it has all the trappings of Rome. There's right there's an aqueduct, so there's also that means you know public baths as well. So sanitation and hygiene is good in the city, or about as good as it can be for late antiquity. Uh, there's a hippodrome, there's a forum, right? So all, all, the thing, all the things that you would find in Rome itself, you can also find in Constantinople. Constantinople also becomes a trade hub because it is the bridge between Europe and Asia, uh, especially with the advent of the Crusades. There's going to be even more of that because the, with the Crusades, there's a good deal more trading between East and West, especially with the establishment of the Crusader kingdoms. We'll talk more about that in future episodes. And the East just generally at this point in time is the more important part of the empire than the West. There's more people in the East. There's more money in the East. The East has been civilized for a much longer time between the Greeks, the Egyptians, the ancient Mesopotamians. Uh, even I was, I was teaching, uh, I teach world history and we're, we're kind of getting into early, the early civilized part of things. We've just moved off primitive man in my class and I'm teaching the, kid, we, uh, the city of Jericho. Uh, the one referenced in the Bible, right? Joshua, the, Jericho, and the walls come down, uh, which would have been in the Eastern Roman Empire. Uh, Jericho seems to have been established as a city somewhere between eight and 10,000 years ago. Uh, certainly, obviously, people were living in 
what is what we would call the Western Roman Empire probably at the time as well, but they're not it's not the same uh, civil civilized type of people. They're they're more barbarian types. The East is also a center of finance, as we said, it's a center of trade, a center of culture, learning. Right? We talked about the um, the many the many schools that are popping up in Alexandria at this time. Lots of learning people are going to Alexandria. People are still going to Greece as well to learn rhetoric. That's obviously a great place to learn that. Uh, many Romans in the classical period went to Greece to learn rhetoric. It's still going on, and as we say, a lot of. Uh, Christian intellectual tradition is going on in Egypt, and as well we'll talk about in the future, uh, church fathers from Cappadocia, which is also in the eastern part of the empire. Really just everything is going on in the east. Even four of the five patriarchal sees are in the eastern Roman Empire, and that would be, so the four patriarchal sees that are in the east, and a patriarchal see is just where a patriarch of the church sits, and he's a regional leader in that area. So there's one in Constantinople, there's one in Antioch, there's one in Jerusalem, and there's one in Alexandria. And then the fifth one is obviously Rome, and that is the only patriarchal seat that's in the West. Although, going, you know, as, as time goes on, it's also going to be Rome is the only of those cities that remains in Christian hands, right? All of the other cities uh, will be controlled by Muslims by 1500, and many of them even well, well before that. Uh, Constantinople is the only one that makes it uh, until the 1400s even. And then obviously in the East as well um, is closer to the greater Roman enemy, which is the Persians, right? The Persians pose the, the greatest threat to the Roman Empire. Although there are many barbarian tribes that are coming across you know, the borders in the West, it doesn't pose nearly the same level of threat to the empire as uh, the Eastern as the Persians in the East do. And you might say, well, you know, Rome fell in the West uh, to the barbarians, but in the East they maintained. We'll talk about, you know, uh, what happened with the fall of the Western Roman Empire as we get to that point. There's a whole confluence of that. I mean, really, you know, I, if, geez, Pat, uh, Patrick Wyman did a whole podcast series on the fall of Rome. You could tell, you know, I know my father is a historian. At one point, he taught a class on the fall of Rome. There's, <laughs> there's, there's a whole lot of reasons and a whole lot of uh, things you can talk about as to why Rome falls, not just, you know, oh, there's so many barbarians coming across the river, they couldn't handle it. Well, that, that was a big part of it. Uh, and then as well, Con uh, Constantinople is also a very defensible city because it's surrounded by three sides on water. We're surrounded on three sides by water, excuse me. And then especially after Theodosius builds his Theodosian walls, uh, no one's going to crack through that city until the Ottomans do in the 1400s. So it's a very easily defensible capital, which is important. You don't, obviously, you don't want to lose the capital of your entire empire. Now we uh, move on to the last part of our episode, which is going to be about uh, Constantine's family legacy. So what kind of position does he leave the empire in, and what do his descendants do going forward? Well, for one, Constantine uh, actually had his oldest son named Crispus uh, killed because he was uh, suspected of being uh, of plot he was suspected of plotting against his father. Uh, it turned out it really that uh, Crispus was not actually involved in this plot against his father, and Constantine was really wrought with guilt for the rest of his life because of this. And to to the modern listener, it's you know it sounds very morbid and uh, very just just crazy that you would have your own son assassinated on the suspicion that he was involved in a conspiracy. But you have to keep in mind that for a Roman Empire. Uh, assassination conspiracies need to be taken very seriously because they happen all the time, right? People are constantly plotting to assassinate the Roman Emperor, and so, you know, they, they take these threats very seriously. I'm not trying to justify him killing his own son, but um, these things are taken with a great, de great degree of seriousness. But Constantine still has three sons. The, is the issue is that Crispus was the most... Uh, competent of his sons. Crispus would have been the one who would have been the best leader of the empire going forward after Constantine passes. But that does not happen. So when Constantine does die, uh, he has three remaining sons, and the empire gets split three ways among them. So there's Constantine II, who rules Gaul, Spain, and Britain. 
You have Constantius, who, is in, who rules in the east, and then you have Constans, who rules in Italy, the Balkans, and North Africa. And as what typically happens, you know, you have a, a great uh, king or emperor or a guy who establishes a new great kingdom, and he's considered a great man in history. And what happens with his sons? They're all a bunch of morons, and they start fighting with each other, and they ruin the whole thing. Now, fortunately for the Romans, uh, Constantine's son's uh, incompetence and infighting doesn't result in the fall of the empire, but they certainly leave the empire in a worse state than when they found it. So the first thing that happens is Constans and Constantine II go to war with each other soon after their father's death, and Constans wins that war, and with it he wins control of the entire Western Empire. However, in 350, uh, yeah, 350 AD, Constans flees his throne because he loses the support of the military to a guy named Magnentius, who then declares himself emperor. And uh, Constans ends up, uh, he's assassinated during, during the time when he's uh, running away. Uh, so now he's got, so you have uh, Constantius, who is still in the east, and you have Magnentius, who is a usurper in the west. So Constantius then goes to war with Magnentius, who's the usurper. Uh, obviously, you can't, have, you can't have these illegitimate rulers going around, and Constantius wins his war against Magnentius, and now Constantius controls the entire empire. Now, in the late 350s, the empire, the Roman Empire was facing two threats kind of simultaneously. You had the Persians, as always, in the east, and then a group of barbarians called the Alamanni in the north, uh, kind of the northwest. Uh, the Alamanni were a group of Germanic barbarians. If you uh, study foreign languages, for example, uh, the right the French word uh, for German is uh, Al or Germany is Alamannia, which is basically comes from would come from the Alamanni, right? Because they were a Germanic tribe, lived uh, uh, close to the Roman borders, so that people in that area would have had frequent contact with the Alamanni. Uh, and so what Constantius does is he prepares to launch his campaign against the Persians in the east, and he leaves his cousin, Julian, to deal with the Alamanni in the west. And it's kind of an interesting pick that Constantius does here, because Julian is really basically like a philosophy professor. He has no military background at all. The Seemingly the only reason that Constantius picks him to lead this army is that Julian is part of the imperial family, for one, although... Not directly, but again, all of Constantius is Constantius's Constantius. Uh, all of his brothers are dead at this point, uh, so he needs somebody to lead an army, and he picks uh, Julian, who we'll talk more about in the next episode, uh, who's honestly kind of kind of kept away for a lot of his life because uh, Constantine's sons wanted to uh, basically eliminate any threats to power. And Julian is actually lucky to be alive because a lot of his uh, direct relatives were killed by Constantius and Constans and Constantine II, again, in order to eliminate potential uh, threats to their power. Uh, but despite all that, uh, even though Julian has no military experience, he goes off to the west and he wins his campaign against the Alamanni. Now, in 357... Or I'm sorry, that happens in 357. Julian and his army handle their their fight with the Alamanni, uh, winning the campaign. Really, the campaign only lasts one battle, but uh, frequently in ancient and even medieval warfare, one pitch battle is enough to win you a campaign. And so Julian defeats the Alamanni at the Battle of Strasbourg. Uh, so putting that in the modern uh, the territory of Alsace Lorraine, which uh, is French today, although. Perhaps if you're German, you might have <laughs> you might have a different opinion about uh, what Alsace Lorraine is to you. It's fine. But so after Julian finishes his campaign against the Alamanni, uh, Constantius calls Julian to bring his army to the east because obviously Constantius is getting this campaign ready for the Persians, or getting ready to campaign against the Persians, and he needs all the help he can get. Obviously, the Persians are a huge enemy. Uh, more troops are going to be better in this situation. This is not right. This is not the small armies of fighting raiding parties. You're going off and you're leading a campaign directly into enemy territory. You're going to be fighting pitch battles. You need more soldiers, right? 
And so, but the issue is that the men in Julian's army do not want to go all the way to the east to fight a campaign against the Persians, right? They're in the west. These are probably soldiers who uh, are from the west. They don't want to go all the way east. That's a long way from home. Uh, the way, you know, think about right on the where, where they are at this point in time is basically right on the border of modern France and Germany. They're hanging out in Gaul. They don't want to go all the way over there. And so what they do is they declare Julian uh, their own emperor. So Julian gets declared emperor by his own soldiers. Uh, and he basically does accept that title, although he's not the... I don't think Julian, at least from what I've, the research I've done on this, it doesn't seem like he tried to instigate this. It really seems like the soldiers just didn't want to go to the east, and so they decided to declare Julian the emperor in the west in order to stay where they wanted to be. But obviously, for Constantius, this is a this is a threat to his to his power, and so he basically abandons the Persian campaign to go handle Julius out in the west. However, Constantius dies while he's marching to go face Julian, and actually, because Constantius has no heirs of his own, uh, he basically declares Julian emperor on his deathbed. And so Julian becomes emperor at age 29, after his cousin Constantius dies, and he is the emperor of the whole empire. He's not splitting it east and west. He's, he's emperor of the whole thing. And this is uh, at the age of 29. Julian is 29 when he rises to be the Roman emperor. And that's where we're going to cut it off for this episode. Next episode, we'll talk more about Julian. You may know him better by his title, Julian the Apostate. That'll be next week's episode. So if you've made it this far in the video or in the podcast, if you're watching on YouTube, please make sure to hit the like button. Make sure to also subscribe and hit the notification bell so you never miss another episode. If you're watching or if you're listening on Spotify, please give us a follow. Uh, if you're watching, or I'm sorry, I keep saying this. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, please uh, follow us or give, uh, subscribe. Give us a five-star review. Only five-star reviews are allowed. Actually, I've set it up so that uh, anything less than a five-star review on iTunes is actually disabled. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. I, have, I actually have like very few tech skills. Um, me starting this podcast was much more me being interested in history than me being good at tech and also knowing some things about it. It's mostly like I, my thing is I, I know a good deal about history. The tech things, I'm really just kind of figuring this out as I go. Um, and then as well, check out our Instagram page. You can go on and search up academics. That's A-C-A-D-E-M-I-X underscore nine five, where I'll post updates about the show, post memes about history that we can all kind of have fun with. And that'll be it for this time. So, Again, thank you for watching, and we'll see you all next time.